Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Anna Martz, the Education USA Branch Chief at the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth episode of the Education USA Dialogues webinar series. It's a free event that explores factors contributing to international student recruitment and success and facilitates meaningful and engaging discussion with campus administrators and practitioners. This webinar series is one of several initiatives the Education USA team has launched under the joint statement of principles in support of international education from the US Departments of State and Education. The Education USA Dialogue supports expanding access to international education and US higher education institutions, campus recruitment and internationalization goals through the dissemination of best practices and laying the groundwork for success for US higher education stakeholders and international students. Today's webinar discussion is connecting global to local, international students and community engagement. We are really thrilled to have three expert panelists from three different higher education institutions who have experience with managing and developing community engagement programs for students. They'll also discuss strategies as well as provide examples for initiating and facilitating meaningful community engagement. A recorded version of this webinar will be available after the event. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished moderator for today's event, Dr. Janelle Ryans, Associate Director for Global Initiatives at NASPA, the Association of Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Education. And our three panelists today are Ms. Cassie Winslow Edmondson, former director of IU Core at Indiana University, Ms. Janeri Mendoza, coordinator of academic support services in the Office of International Student and Scholar Services, and the founder of the International Community Engagement Program, or ISAP, at Florida International University, and Ms. Tia Gomez Zeller, Associate Director, Director of International Student Retention at Lane Community College in Eugene, Oregon. The bios for all of our speakers and our moderator can be found on the Education USA website. Janelle, thank you so much for moderating today's discussion. I'll now turn it over to you to get our conversation started. Thank you. Greetings. Welcome to our Education USA webinar. Again, my name is Dr. Janelle Ryans and I serve as the Associate Director for Global Initiatives at NASPA. NASPA is the professional home for the field of student affairs. Founded in 1918 by six men at the University of Wisconsin, NASPA has grown to become a diverse international organization with over 15,000 members in all 50 states, 25 countries, and in eight U.S. territories. NASPA is dedicated to fulfilling the promise of higher education through our guiding principles of integrity, innovation, inclusion, and inquiry. We place students at the center of our work, serving the field through exceptional professional development, research to take on our biggest challenges, advocacy for inclusive and equitable practices in communities, and nurturing networks and pipelines to mentor, rejuvenate, and support students. I personally have a passion for international education and received my PhD in international and comparative education from UCLA. I've lived on three continents, traveled to six continents, and have lived abroad and traveled to 47 countries in the world, around the world in my scholarship as a practitioner of higher education and student affairs. In my role as the leader of global initiatives at NASPA, I also serve on NASPA's global division. The primary purpose of the global division is to represent the global interests of NASPA and to uh, represent student affairs education or educators, practitioners, and professionals around the world and support the advancement of international student affairs issues, advocating for intercultural competency, global awareness, supporting the association in the field of student affairs around the world. With my work with NASA, we also have our knowledge community of civic learning and the democratic engagement for NASA members. For this knowledge community, we want to create a space for professional development, ideal generation, and scholarship around civic education and community service. The CLDE KC supports student affairs professionals as they promote engaged citizenship, student development, and democracy in our communities, respect for, and appreciation for diversity and advocacy for applied learning and civic engagement. I share these resources with you today as we begin the discussion for supporting our international students around community engagement. Thank you again, Anna, for that lovely introduction and a big thanks to our attendees here who are here today to engage in this conversation around connecting to global to local international students and community engagement. For the next hour or so, 
we have the opportunity to hear from professionals in the field of international students and in the field of community engagement to discuss best practices and opportunities on our campuses to immerse our international students in service and community learning. In this conversation, I encourage you to consider key points from our panelists today. Think about how you can implement some of the best practices shared on your college campus and universities. Think about some of the challenges you've experienced in the past few years and how you've been able to overcome and support and gain successful tools to continue this work. And think overall how you can create a positive and enriching experience for your international students as they support your communities. Before we officially begin this conversation, I would like to take the chance to first introduce a simple poll for our attendees. Um, this poll is designed to gauge who's in the audience and how best to frame our conversation as it relates to your student body population and international students on campus. It's only going to take about a couple of minutes. There are about three questions listed, and we would like to find out a little bit more about you and who's in the room. With this, with the variety of professionals attending our workshop today, we want to capture some of this information as we frame the conversation for today. We're going to take about 15 more seconds or so for you to complete the poll. about five more seconds. I think we are about at time. And so thank you again for completing the poll in the room. A majority of our, of our um, attendees are working at universities and institutions that support doctoral, master's, and um, at, uh, back to uh, students as well, a couple from associate degrees, some from nonprofits, some for profit, and some of our government um, uh, universe, uh, government institutions as well. That is great to hear. As far as our inter international students, we have a good, good balance of who's in the room. Some have upwards of, uh, of uh, about 300 to 500 to some have a thousand some have four uh, almost five thousand yeah some are uncertain that's that is quite all right thank you for taking the time to fill out the, the survey and for our last questions um many of you majority of you do support um community engagement programming for international students and that's great to hear thanks again for taking the time to to take uh to take the, some time to fill out the poll and now I would like to turn over our conversation with today to our panelists, Casey, Cassie Winslow Edmondson. She should suppose she could share a little bit about herself and her experiences and her work as we begin our topic today, global to local international students and community engagement. Thanks, Cassie. Thank you so much, Janelle, and thank you everyone for taking the time, whether it's morning or night where you are, but for you to be present to, to hear more from us. Um, I wanted to share a little more information about my institution. It was so helpful to see that poll to get a better understanding of who's here and why you're here, or maybe some of those motivations. And so that way I already feel like I can connect with some of you on here. So our institution, um, pre-COVID, and I hate saying pre-COVID, but pre-COVID, um, we had a little over 6,000 um, residential students on our campus that were identified as international students. And so um, that's everything from undergraduates to um, master's level to doctoral um, or postdoc, sort of all those levels. And so our university, we have about 42,000 students overall, could be characterized as a decentralized campus. And so maybe some of you on here can identify in sort of that structure in that way. And so I'll be speaking from my experience from that lens and that type of structure. One thing on our campus is this decentralized model is what we learned is that we had hundreds of departments that had community engagement as part of their mission or their goals or objectives for their units. 150 at least, that's what we could find. We had over 200 200 service learning courses offered per year where students could enroll and participate in community projects. And then we had over 240 student organizations. So 
basically that is really complex for any student to navigate and so my unit was started about five years ago um, approximately five years ago to help students navigate through that intricate web of experiences and so my expertise is about helping students including international students find opportunities to engage in meaningful ways um, and some of the ways we did this is we had to create a database um, behind the scenes to manage to organize to document and track those types of experiences. Additionally, we had uh, with our unit, we had a close partnership with our Office of International Services. Um, our office understandably takes a, the working definition of what is volunteerism. This is a definition we've really struggled with as a campus of what is volunteerism, what counts as it, what doesn't count for it, what can international students participate in, what can they not participate in. And so a lot of my experience has been in having those conversations with colleagues um, to ensure that they're not violating visa restrictions and so, and then working really creatively. So you all probably already know this, but um, our OIS office, our international services, defines it how the government defines it, which is someone who performs a public um, service for civic, charitable, or humanitarian reasons um, with no expectation of compensation. And we take compensation very seriously. That's not necessarily money. That could be a meal. That could be all kinds of things. And so we have spent a lot of time thinking through how can we really protect um, students as they engage in volunteerism so that we don't put them at risk. And so we, our program created a really interesting I think it's wonderful. Um, I'm biased, though. Uh, a program called Start. So we created a, a community engagement program that was closely married to their academic curriculum, although not part of the curriculum, but close enough to it that it was considered part of their academic experience. And so I can talk more about that later on. But I just look forward. That's a little bit of background about some of the background that I have. Um, for our campus as a whole, just so you have an understanding of how we're defining service, we're still in the process of defining it, not everyone agrees, um, but we define service um, as a campus as volunteer service or community engagement um, activities that address social issues and needs identified by community partners, helping students become engaged, productive, um, responsible members of society. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Janeri to introduce herself. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with all, all of you today and also to learn about these other initiatives with other organizations and other institutions. Uh, so my name is Janeri Mendoza. I represent um, Florida International University. Uh, Florida International University is a state institution. Um, we do serve uh, over 55,000 students and of that a number about 4,000 are international students. Um, the representation in our in our university is about 143 countries, and as uh, the top countries uh, that the international students come from, we have China, India, and Venezuela. So, as an international student advisor, um, in my sessions with my students, I kind of saw a gap um, because the students were asking about uh, ways to get involved, volunteer with the community, and so on in these advising sessions. Um, so I saw an opportunity to bring into our programming at the International Student and Scholar Services Office a community engagement program. Um, this program was developed and presented to the senior director in our office who supported this initiative, uh, and we were able to launch it in fall 2018. Uh, with the idea of creating global awareness uh, on social issues that we have in the United States as well, integrating our international students and scholars, and also bringing them into the community to serve our community as well. So why community engagement? Uh, based on research, community engagement among international students has shown to have a variety of positive outcomes, uh, both from the individual and community at large, and international students who have a higher level of contact with their local communities, they perform better academically and socially. And it also creates a sense of belonging. So the International Community Engagement Program mission, it is to prepare the international students at FIU to be active global citizens uh, who develop global awareness and global perspectives through civic engagement. Uh, the vision for, for the program, it is to uh, acquire, to provide the students with the opportunity to acquire knowledge, skills, and attitudes uh, through community engagement programs. Um, it is facilitated in a hybrid mode, 
uh, where we meet virtually for our social um, uh, issues workshops, and also in person for team building activities, as well as service projects. Um, to give you an idea on how this broad workshop look like, uh, we covered topics on human rights, on women's rights, social justice, homelessness, sustainable development goals, uh, sustainability and the environment, and also a cultural belonging. Um, there are also a students that are part of the program that are passionate about a topic, so we also bring them on board to facilitate this workshop. Um, and we also collaborate strongly with other departments at Florida International University and nonprofit organizations as well. Um, on the team building activities, because it has been a program that already had reached four years, um, we have students that want to give back to the program. So there is a group of student leaders that they create team building activities, icebreakers, and also a way to connect all members of the group. And then in regards to the service project, uh, this is where the students go and then they contribute to the community. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, once again, uh, this was a little bit more elaborated. Um, now the capacity levels are a little bit different um, because of COVID. But some of the service projects might look like visiting a homeless shelter to serve a meal, uh, decorating cupcakes at a hospital with children, packing uh, goods for disaster relief, and then uh, maybe cleaning a nature preserve on campus or our base. Um, now, throughout the COVID experience, we had also come a little bit more creative on the service project. So we have collaborated with other organizations where we bring the students on campus and they may write letters to our veterans, uh, letters to refugees, um, refugee families, and also letters to children in hospitals. Another project that is uh, quite popular uh, within ISEP, it is the True Box of Joy. Uh, so this is boxes that the students put together with books inside to send during the holiday seasons to children around the world. Um, the program, it, is, it has two opportunities, community level covering these core components uh, where the students apply, they are part of the program in the semester, they participate in everything. Um, and then if they have an active membership, which requires to workshops, to building activities, and to service projects, then they do get a certificate of completion and also a team as a memory uh, for their participation and their time for the program. And also, they also get an opportunity to represent the program on the national level. So this national level is where we take the group of students uh, to Washington, D.C. to connect with government entities, uh, nonprofit organizations, and also understand a little bit more our U.S. democracy and, um, and the U.S. history as well. So as students that get the invitation to go to Washington, D.C., as those are students that are active in the program, uh, it is a very competitive application uh, where the students need to propose also an idea using the skills, the knowledge that they learn throughout the program. Um, a committee selects a number of students, and then we go to Washington, D.C. for three days um, in collaboration with FIU, D.C., and also with the strong support of the ISSS office and the Global First Year office, uh, who have been uh, some partners of this initiative. Um, usually, students, when they go to Washington, D.C., they come back more excited and looking for more ways to integrate those ideas and um, everything that they learn. Uh, to continue contributing to the community. Um, as any other program, there are challenges as well. I briefly will mention some of the challenges, but I'm sure our conversation will bring opportunities uh, to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but one of the challenges is the human resources, having the staffing, the proper staffing, dividing the duties and responsibilities so that way it doesn't become a big load uh, for one person. Uh, also, utilizing our student leaders as well, that is another tactic to incorporate uh, the capacity. Sometimes the capacity for volunteer sites, it might require only 20 participants, so you may have to divide it in multiple groups. Um, it comes with creativity on how to divide it, um, but that's also considered another challenge. And in regards to the funding, it could also be a challenge. Uh, there has to be a budget allocation within the department. Also, partnership is crucial. Uh, for this kind of program, especially with institutions that have so many programs across campus 
there is a way to collaborate and not and also not to replicate uh, the same um, programs. And sponsorships are great too. And then fundraising. This is another one that recently was incorporated by our uh, leaders, the student leaders. They now do fundraising for uh, service projects that we have. Um, so overall, this is kind of a little bit of an idea on how the program works. Uh, but now I would like to turn it over to Tina uh, so she can continue our conversation for today. Thank you. Thank you, Janari. Hi, everyone. Um, again, my name is Tia. I work at Lane Community College in Eugene, Oregon. And like Janari, when I started as an advisor, I saw a big gap too. Students were anxious to get into the American culture. They want to be part and they didn't know how, how to do it. I knew, I know when I came to the United States like 15 years ago, I didn't know. I know I had to have a big resume, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to start. And part of the reason I got to education is because I didn't want international students to suffer as much as I did when I came to this country, because it's, it's, it's a change of everything. Even if you come from, you know, I come from Europe, very similar culture, still very different at the same time. So um, I started with a peer mentor program just to get that support from before they were coming. We were reaching out to a student so they weren't so afraid crying in the, in the plane because they know someone, their peer mentor will be there in the airport to support them, to take them to the apartment and help them to set up. Um, and I wanted to expand them more. We did have a small peer mentor program, but I'm like, this is not enough for students. So as a part of the peer mentor program, we divide in different leaders. So we have our academic leaders. Uh, we do ESL, we do have ESL program and credit program for associates. So we have the ESL academic leaders who are students who have completed the ESL program and different academic leader from different majors so they can help with the science, especially on the writing, which is the hardest. And we have conversation leaders as well uh, to just help to practice. And with that, uh, we started with Coffee Talk and bringing uh, resident American students to talk to our students to, you know, so our students could practice English and our American students could learn more. And that created more, you know, more anxious from the resident student to get to know more about international students and international students to get more about the American culture and get mixed. So really Coffee Talk was a great bridge to bring that of internationals and resident and start creating a community from there. But it's still, they wanted more, <laughs> they wanted more, right? Um, so we created a piece on interna internationalization as well as um, volunteers. We have some students who do volunteer leaders and as all the peer mentor work in internationalization. So they all have to give presentation. Um, in Oregon, many of our four-year institutions, they have what they call ICSP, which they present about their culture and they get a scholarship and they the purpose is all our peer mentor, if they wanted to become ICSP, so they didn't have to pay for tuition, they could get it. So far, it has worked so good. Um, so with that, uh, we started looking, Americans were like, to our international students, oh, do you know about the learning garden? Do you know about a student government? Do you know about our food pantry? So we started creating this a specific event where, hey, sign up, to go to the learning garden to work on that. Sign up to go to a student government meeting, see what's going on and stop by a student government meeting. And um, that's how it really created. So our volunteer leaders, uh, we do have three and each week they have a different organization that they work with and sign up the students. So we have worked with different organization like NWACP, uh, Eugene Islamic Center, a lot of churches organizations. Uh, we also work for those students who are more interested in political science and they don't know how to get that experience. We work very close for, with a student government, but also we work very close with Oregon a Student Association, which is an association in Oregon 
that work with all the student leaders uh, to advocate. So they get to go to the state capital. Uh, we don't have the money to get them to Washington DC, but at least we get them to the state capital. We get that experience. We take them to lobby. We teach them how to lobby, how to make a ask, how to present different topics, which I'm super excited because that's a lot of what I did in college too. So um, it has been amazing, especially when the pandemic came. And that's what I get good spot because when the pandemic came, you know, our students didn't have a way to get money. They were running out of food. They were running out of resources. They couldn't pay for rent and the community turned to us. They were like, you know, you have been doing food drives for us. You have been cooking for our homeless youth. You have been collecting clothes for, you know, for our poor people. And our community just turned around. They were like, here's food. Here's money to help with rent. Here's this, here's that. And it's just, it was just so amazing. I mean, I wasn't planning that, right? The student didn't expect a pandemic and that we would need our help. But that's where really it, it felt like, you know, there are no international students. I had a student like, I don't feel international student anymore. Like if I don't look the passport, I'm American. <laughs> Um, and they, you know, they, they connected with the people and it's, it's just wonderful when you say like they had really become a community. As a community college, we have very limited resources. I didn't have all those offices and programs doing community service. So I really had to be creative um, and like generally say, student leaders, they're great tools, right? To divide and conquer. So, and, you know, with the pandemic as well, um, students were like, I, I know in the future, I wanna, you know, work for your office or whatever, like, how can I help? They got involved in every possible way. We did fundraiser, um, we work with NWCP, uh, to help them do fundraiser many times. And when the pandemic came, they did a whole event on Ramadan just for us so we could do fundraiser and all the money was just going for our students. Because uh, all the Ramadan events we had done in the past, it was you know collecting for them and for the Islamic Center. So that turned around and helped us out. And it's been a wonderful journey. Um, I am very passionate. My master's thesis was in cultural competency. I'm very passionate about social justice. And I learned I cannot do all the work for myself. So I created a little army of global citizens that they will go and change the world. And hopefully you all can get some tips from us so you can do the same with your students. And I will pass it to you now. Well, a big thanks to our panelists for those amazing introductions to Tia, Janeri, and um, Cassie to hear about all the work that you do and the breadth that you bring to this conversation on today's topic around international students and community engagement. As for our attendees, you all had an opportunity to submit questions for our panelists at the time of registration. And so I do want to pull a couple of different questions from, um, from you all um, to ask our panelists. So the first question, and this is gonna be a question open to um, any and all of our panelists, is going to be around when working, when supporting um, international students, how do you connect international students with religious organizations within your community? I know Tia touched a little bit on it just recently, but if maybe you all can speak to how you support our international students around religious um, organizations and, and such as that. And I'll have uh, Cassie kick it off for us. Wonderful. So we we take a couple different pronged approach um, with this. So first is I we let me start from the beginning is let's start with a pronged approach. So if students approach us and tell me, hey, I'm really looking for this type of experience. One of the first things I try to do is first to see if we have something that exists currently on our campus that um, will provide them this type of opportunity. So like I mentioned earlier, we have over 150 different um, units on our campus that have you know, tons of programs underneath in each of those. And I know when I, my hope when I pass a student off to a colleague is that that 
can become a flourishing mentoring relationship um, for that individual or for that student. Um, other situations, um, other places I point them is we have a really close partnership with our local city, um, city of Bloomington, where we share opportunities with one another. And so their, their database is open to all types of community organizations, including religious. Um, we do have some guidelines, at least the city has guidelines that they will post um, religious opportunities as long as it's not about um, prophesying or um, furthering sort of that mission. But if it is a service oriented, so if they have a pantry or if they're doing a community outreach program, um, those opportunities are then passed through us. And then we also help promote and target students. Um, another way that we get international students connected to religious um, opportunities. Um, so for example, I have a partner in Southern Indiana and one of our rural partners, and they're looking specifically, they're, they're responding to, um, oh, what is it, substance, substance use disorder, and they're looking for students who have expertise in this. And so I reach out to my colleagues in sociology or other individuals. And what I often find, and I believe um, Janeri was talking about this earlier in TSM2, um, about this resume developing experience. And so this is almost like a service research experience. And so many of our international students really crave getting that type of experience because it's way more difficult on our campus for them to engage in, um, positions, paid positions beyond the university, unless there's some special qualifiers. So in that, we've created this really cool program called START. It's called our Student Agile Response Team. And what it does is it partners a student up with an, a unit, such as a religious organization or others, to collaboratively work through um, something usually beyond just a labor-oriented, um, not painting fences, but typically research-oriented. Um, so if we've done one recently for food scarcity for an organization, religious organization that was looking in the region on how can they work with young children. So we have found that that is one of our best pathways is we really want to make sure that we just don't pass the student off to community agency just sort of like here's the options but rather how can we have something more sustained and long term um, and that's sort of how we work with our partners um, so we're open to all types and kinds so I, I hope that was helpful yes thank you so much for sharing Cassie and I like to offer opportunity for any of our other panelists to come in as well And like, like Cassie um, and the IFA program, we also uh, kind of concentrate on the mission and the goal um, when partnering with religious organizations. Um, an example is the Shoebox of Joy. Uh, it is with a religious organization that this uh, initiative takes place. And we actually partner with our Bible club on campus as well. They come and we work together into the mission, which is building shoe boxes. Um, we do appreciate also the diversity in our group, especially because the international students, they bring that beauty into the program. Uh, so there is also when we do it, we do have the collection where we put the items inside and there is a prayer corner to give that also sense of uh, community and uh, spirituality as well to the program. So the options are open and available, uh, but we concentrate on the mission and the goal of the particular program. Yeah, and to add a uh, couple of things. So something that we do at Lane Community College is uh, we do have a welcome handout that we go through it during orientation. And it has different churches, different religions, organizations. So they kind of have an idea in the beginning what they can connect to. The other thing that we do is um, we partner with different religions, organizations. So when they have an event, we just let the student know that the event is there, that is part of this religion organization, and a student can decide whether they want to go or not. And um, also the peer mentors, I try to hire uh, peer mentors that they have diverse religions or not religion as well, because some students don't, you know, might don't have a religion. So they have a peer mentor normally that they can connect you know, especially if they're struggling with their face and things like that. And again, I, I work, I love to work with religion organization. I'm not religious myself, but I would love to work with them because, you know, they they really make a students to feel part of the community. And I have seen how how many students, how connecting with those religion organizations have been 
the first step to feel part of a community. So, you know, I would really encourage you to just give, give them the options. This is what, what is there for you so they know, and that might be very, very beneficial for them. Thank you all. Thanks for sharing. And um, what's about to me is that you all have great examples of how um, working with uh, when creating partnerships within your communities, you've been able to support your, your students, uh, international students with these religious um, opportunities and engagement. But I, I wonder how have you all been able to uh, and how, how do you approach to get the buy in from your communities to support international community engagement at community colleges at your institutions? If you could share a little bit more about that. Um, so it's actually not that hard. <laughs> it's just uh, many times, you know, especially those students who have been older, have been longer, they're no older, longer in the institution, uh, they're already connected. So like I had a student who were connected with the Islamic centers. I was like, hey, can I go with you? Introduce, you know, so I use the student as a connection. Uh, the other thing with community college, which it was, very fun is uh, our community college have many events and they need help right to set up um, our community members to you know help out around whatever and our students become the number one volunteer so our community college goodness our international students are very important are like you know they're an event they're there they're everywhere uh, no matter where you go to an event, they're going to be there. So that also helped the institution to get more buy-in on like, we really need to invest with these students because they're bringing much more of what we think. And yeah, just, just say, hey, I want to work with you. What can we do together? It's amazing. People are normally super open to work with you and bring that diversity, you know. And if don't, you know, might be an organization that's not worth to work. You know, if you go there and say, which I had organizations like that, where, you know, they weren't responsive of like, okay, well, we will go to another organization, another institution, another religion uh, institution to, to help them out. So just ask. I wanted to add a little bit to that as well. I We've had similar experiences here in Bloomington, our community, because so many of our students are doctoral level and master's level. Many of them frequently have children and other family. And um, we have a lot of subcultures within our Bloomington community. And so these students are often highly sought out to provide like um, assistance in education, cultural understanding, support in the school systems um, with some of the younger kids. And so our our, our challenges haven't really been locally. It's been a really positive relationship. We just um, started a new center. It's called the Center for Rural Engagement to help take some of this culture and experience and knowledge and resources to our rural, um, predominantly um, predominantly white um, areas. And that, that's that been a really interesting and really fun experience. Um, there, I could observe some hesitancy at times and concern. They would see students who were different or, and so we actually, instead of, you know, reacted negatively, we tried to plan ahead. So working with OIS on like, how do you work with people who are different than you? And like, how do you approach, like, if you've never been exposed to anyone besides someone who's white, how do you engage in that? And what are the differences besides the stereotypes that you've been taught or understood or seen through TV? And so, one thing I really love about our um, rural center programming is that it's very intentional. Um, we took, for example, our Jacob School of Music students to actually play instruments alongside um, students in rural Indiana and in their music programs. Um, and we have some of the best world renowned musicians from all over the world. Uh, many of them international as well and so for a student to sit alongside another student to experience their culture and be an expert and I, I just love the experience our international students have because it, it puts them in the position of being an expert um, to be a thought leader to be all these that have they have so much to offer and this gives them so many opportunities to exchange knowledge and experiences um, and often like sometimes it can be a little awkward in our first meetings and I, I feel like most of the time it's just nervousness of partners not knowing what to do and how to communicate and not wanting to step on toes and um but overall i've heard over and over like it's been some of the best experiences they've had and they're so excited and then their friendships continue on beyond 
the program, which is my favorite part. It's like, now they've got a pen pal that they're, and due to COVID, the one positive for us is it's opened up so many opportunities to um, engage our international students with individuals who might never have been exposed to other cultures like this um, through virtual means. So before when we'd have to drive our students to these communities and um, many of our community partners now have the bandwidth and the internet and the technology now that our student doesn't have to drive down there and there's not a barrier and we don't have to have a staff member from IU take them down there. Instead, we can bring them together in this new virtual space to still complete meaningful work. Thank you. Thank you all for those great responses. Um, and so um, this question is for Janari, but um, feel free to um, also share as well. When thinking about how to support international students, especially around um, community service and, and development, um, Janari, you mentioned a trip to DC. How was that funded? How how were international students able to travel? And, and the bigger question is how do how if international students are able to travel to anywhere um, when it comes to uh, supporting their uh, overall community engagement um, and its experiences? Uh, well, the initiative for uh, Washington DC it originated when the program was founded. Um, it was kind of an idea from our secretary director. Um, we do have at, in Washington, D.C., uh, Florida International University has also um, a space in there uh, because of how crucial it is to be closer to uh, the government and things, for, things like that. So we, um, we do have a representative from the university that handles the fly-ins for the entire university. Uh, so this is something that is a practice in multiple departments at FIU. Um, so the uh, idea originated to create that within ISF. Uh, the funding comes from uh, the ISSF office and the Global First Year office. So it is uh, a full scholarship that the students receive. Um, those, it's a small, it's a small uh, selected number of students, five to six students that will get to take to Washington DC, but the university covers the expenses and it is guided. So um, either myself or a staff member from the office goes to Washington DC with, with the students to connect with the government entities and the nonprofit organizations. The itinerary is created also from our FIUDC um, in department and then uh, the whole logistics on the uh, visit and also the tools and everything else uh, gets coordinated by them as well with uh, a lot of collaboration with myself. Uh, so we do have meetings and we create a team uh, for the for the flight in experience. And then there is a whole itinerary uh, that we put together. Recently, about two weeks ago, we were in DC with those students that were awarded. Um, and we actually visited Education USA and connected with members of Education USA and Fulbright um, members as well. Thank you for sharing. I have a question for Cassie and for everyone as well. Um, uh, from your experience, who should be involved to create um, incur and encourage international students community engagement? Is it the responsibility of the international student office or other departments on campus or the individual student? What's your take on that? I think everyone at the university is responsible. and. I think especially at a large institution, it's easy to pass that buck and be like, oh, that's yours or, you know, that's because we're in silos. Um, and we have found through the past, at least since I've been working in the office the past five years, is we, we've worked a lot more to do a lot more collaborative programming, um, intentional targeting of students with so much more data available and at your fingertips and with Salesforce and, mail, you know, all the, the tools where you can target and engage. Um, I find that um, our collaborations can be more powerful. We at our institution, hope possibly at other institutions, is we notice sort of um, arcs of behavior and sort of changes. We have sort of like our tax season, you know, in April. You no, know. so ours is like early August. We have super intense um, desire from students who want to participate. Um, they're new to the campus. They're excited to meet individuals. I consider it's like so easy to do programming, like. You put it out there and they come. So this past fall we did, uh, it was called tape art where we did tape murals um, where students got to tape these beautiful murals in our town and collaboratively with the community. Um, and we targeted international students. We, we made intentional, you know, with Salesforce now you can do targeted email and communication based off of a certain criteria or characteristic. And so that that was a really, really positive thing. And then you get come towards December and, you know, 
things are pretty slow around town and then you know gears back up and then you know by end of march beginning of april it's about done again so we notice sort of there's a trend but i find that when we collaborate and share funds um rather than being one thing I've noticed at large institutions is sometimes you can be in competition with your peers at your own institution because everyone's vying for that same student's attention. And so what we've noticed instead of doing a lot more smaller programming, um, we've done more campus wide programming. So we do an arts festival and we all collaborate together. We do a culture festival and we all come together and work. Um, and I find that it's a lot easier to get a lot more students there. It's a lot easier, you know, if a student knows that their friend's going, then they're more likely to go to. Uh, so we find that larger is often better. Um, on community engagement things, if we're doing individual day trips, places, that's a little bit different. We try to do um, smaller groupings with friends, like bring a friend event. So that way, I find with international students, they it is really scary. And I think Tia, you were mentioning that earlier, like being terrified on the plane and getting off. Like I can't even begin to imagine it. So a lot of our communication marketing is like, bring a friend, don't do this alone. Like you're gonna meet friends. And most of our language isn't really around the community engagement. It's more about how do you find community at our university with your peers and community service just happens to be a great way to accomplish that. And that's sort of the lens we take and style. Great question though, thank you. Any of our other panelists like to comment on how on how was involved in encouraging international students and community engagement? Yeah. Um, so I think, like Kazi say, you know, it tends to be like here, you do it. International, anything with international goes to the international office, right? And a way that I personally try to trend that around is again by by encourage international students to volunteer for those events that the school had so they could see like oh my goodness like if they're helping just with tia telling them to do it what would happen if we're all you know collaborating to to make it happen so that that i saw you know a shift of mentality and seeing you know how important it is for everyone to be involved on taking care of international students Yeah, and I think an add on that as well, like Cassie and Tia, um, at Florida International University, we do like to collaborate a lot um, because uh, serving not just the international students, but all the FIU students, it takes a lot of work. Uh, so the minute that there is an opportunity to collaborate, we join forces and instead of replicating them. Uh, so there is a strong relationship with the Center for Leadership and Service, which is that office that handles service learning and community engagement, um, as well as the uh, global learning uh, office, the global learning initiatives office um, in the global first year. So these are like university offices within FIU that handle the international component a lot, uh, but we come and we try to collaborate as much as possible. Uh, so that way it doesn't create more work uh, in the international office. All great responses. Thank you so much for sharing. I do have another question for all of our panelists. Um, so do you all work with alumni when you develop opportunities for international students? And if you do, can you share some of the ways that you engage your alumni? And I'll kick it off with Janari's answer. Thank you, Janelle. So um, this actually happened recently. Um, we started getting uh, students who are uh, transitioning into being an alumni, but also applying for their OPT experience. Um, so within the program, as I mentioned, it has a, a student leaders. And these are student leaders, they have a specific duties uh, that they relate to marketing, to leadership, uh, to leading workshops, to mentorship, etc. Uh, so we came across a couple of students that want to give back to the program. So as international students, they're allowed to volunteer as well when they're doing OPT. Uh, but if it is directly related to their major, now they're also doing this experience part time uh, within ICEP to give back to the program and also to acquire those leadership skills. Uh, so based on the program, uh, we might be able to do it. Some we might not be able to do it, but we have had an amazing uh, uh, collaboration with our alumni who are currently doing OPT 
Um, the way how it works, we do have a coordinator in the office that serves as a leader for uh, our student leader. Um, and then we meet with the student to see what they would like to do out of their experience. There is also a job description uh, and things like that. But that's one way how we integrate our alumni into the program. Working on it. So, because my alumni, I mean, I would say our alumni is our number one recruiter. Uh, for our institution, especially our student leaders who graduate alumni, they, they do presentation in their home countries for us, even their parents do presentation. And uh, similar to Janari, for those who are uh, doing OPT and they have been peer mentors, they help me during the summer to facilitate their peer mentor training on diversity, conflict resolution, you know, put in their perspective coming from, you know, I just finished a two year peer mentor and I thought these training were stupid in the beginning. And now I realize I should have paid more attention. Um, you know, so it has been very beneficial for me. So I don't have to do the whole training, just me tagging. Um, and also for a student to get that real perspective on, you know, what is what it is to be a, a peer mentor, what is to be a leader, what is to be a volunteer that have been super helpful. And again, they're your best recruiters. So, you know, connect with them. I use WhatsApp a lot, Facebook uh, pages where I connect with them. Um, and they, they send a message all the time to WhatsApp to happy birthday to this, happy birthday, happy new year. So it's super fun to keep in connection with them. Plus you get a bunch of candies from different countries every time they come and visit. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing. So um, my next question for the group is, in a time of conflict, war, terrorism, political unrest, just um, sheer lack of understanding societal um, past historical um, issues around the culture of a, of a university or country, what are some of your tactics and how you create community amongst your international students and, and local students within such diversity? I could, I'll try to give an ex, ex, um, example. I, I think our school is really good at keeping track, at least globally, what's going on and being able to know what students may or may not. We have a whole system called the CARES system. So anyone can report and share anything, well, just in general, but about an individual student. So one of our students had um, was from Burma and um, was speaking out. And so she was doing all this advocacy work here in the United States. And then that was putting her father at risk. And so we had this interesting conversation. It was really powerful because we got, to, she got to share that narrative and that story with her peers. So it's part of a student leadership group. Um, but this experience, like what we had where the student got to share experience, people could understand firsthand, like, what does it mean to be a student abroad while you have a, this huge conflict going on at home and your family might be at risk. And so it was very educational for our students. Um, there's so much, I, I just feel like there's so much that international students teach and educate our students about that we never can even think about. Um, but I know that our campus is very intentional about keeping track of these things, making sure that the student is connected to someone. Um, I feel like our professors are really good at being aware of students, where they're from, what's going on, providing space in the classroom, social justice issues, you name it. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier is we have a really strong student organization um, present. We have over 800 on this campus, but almost every single country has their own student organization here. And so there's, and every student organization has a faculty or staff mentor from our university too. So there is a lot of intentionality and a lot of work um, done to support students in that way. Um, we are, depending on what's going on in the world, our campus leadership also sends out communication to our entire student body just to help educate and provide empathy to explain like, here's what your peers are going through, or here's, here's what's going on, or here's our st campus's statement of support for our students. And so I, I really appreciate our, our, with all this extra data, I love data, I'm like a huge data nerd, but I love having all this wonderful data so we can sort of watch and maintain and make sure someone is engaging with all of our students. So for me, being a small institution, um, 
maybe I don't get that much support, but also because I have a small amount of students, it's easy for me, my office and our peer mentors to personally reach out to every single student, you know, when something happened. So we do really a one-on-one, -on -one. again, a small institution, less number, less support. Of course, our president, you know, when something big comes, we're like, hey, time for you to send an email, make sure, you know, that the community know what's going on what's going on and how you know our office tend to review those messages and give tips on you know might be good for you to add that on how to support a student um things like that so yeah it's very very one-on-one -on -one, but again a small institution most of our students live in our student housing so it's just me knocking the door up here mentor who lives there knocking on the door and be how are you doing what do you need in another institution as well, um, like Cassie, um, all departments and leaders come together uh, to support our international students when disasters happen around the world. Um, the current uh, situation that we have is the war in Ukraine. Um, the university came together, created a task force. There is a fundraising going on as well, and different. Um, uh, avenues of contribution for our students uh, that are healing uh, through this catastrophe as well. And the same way it works with other uh, natural disasters uh, that affect our international students, particularly uh, the office uh, takes the lead into uh, being part of this task force and working with leaders to make sure that we provide to our students what they need, as well as uh, support um, due to mental health, um, issues as well. So the Office of CAPS, they also come in on board and they support in that uh, aspect as well. Thanks for sharing. You all have uh, great responses around supporting our international students. I do have a follow-up question. Um, when thinking about, um, and, and as you all shared around the great, amazing resources you have within your campus partnerships, but can you share a little bit about maybe resources around peer-to-peer? -peer? I know you mentioned someone, uh, I believe it was Cassie, you may have mentioned it peer to peer earlier, um, or maybe someone else. I apologize if I get that wrong. But uh, but if there's any opportunities around um, other students supporting um, international students, and or even international students supporting other international students around times of, of conflict or crisis. So I think I was me with the peer mentors. Like I say. I try to get peer mentors that are very diverse from different countries, from different religion, and from different experience. So uh, I use them a lot. They're normally, you know, at least I have a very close relationship with the student. They're, you go and check on them. What, what did you get? Because me as an advisor or as a director, you know, the student might not feel so comfortable to tell me what's going on but they probably will feel comfortable with the peer. And then the peer, you know, tells me what it needs. And I do, uh, I do a lot of training on that because I know that's very hard for peers to, oh, I feel like, you know, um, they don't want anyone to know. So we do a lot of training on red flags on, you know, when you need to communicate what, and, you know, different ways of talking to the student when it's something that, you know, is very important that the student might don't want to share, but it's very important for me to know. Uh, we do train the students on how to have that conversation and how to do that transition as smoothly. So maybe, you know, it's better that the student come with the peer mentor, you know, and talk to me. Oh, we just, we kind of assess together depending on the student situation, but they're my saviors. They are my saviors and they're my eyes because they have eyes. So sometimes, you know, they're the one coming to me and say, hey, this is students not doing good. How can we support them? Um, I think the part I mentioned in like the peer to peer realm is more of our student groups and student organizations. One thing that our Office of International Services has is a leadership council. So leaders from each of those student organizations also come together to discuss core issues and topics. Um, they also work collaboratively together to address issues, whether it's systemic racism, um, you know, with COVID and some, um, a lot of bias towards um, Asian Americans or whatever it might be. They work together to collaboratively um, work through that. And the neat thing about student leadership structures, I think at least not 
and it probably exists in most places is a lot of times our student leaders are in leaders in more than one place so that there's so much overlap so a lot of our core student leadership structures on campus usually have at least one position that's international focused if not more than one international focus on it um, or student well-being whether that's graduate undergraduate um, what we find is that our needs of our students at each of those levels are very different um, so someone earlier was mentioning um, food scarcity and having covered, I think that was UTIA. Um, so we have a cupboard, for example, and our master's students are using it a lot more than our undergraduates. And it's mainly our master's international students. So why is that? And so then we have a group of students researching into that and trying to dig in and figure out, okay, well, they're not getting access to certain certain things that they should be getting access to in the community. So like maybe our campus isn't poised to to do that as well as it could, whereas we have all these food resources in our community. So these leaders are working together to figure out what's the gap between the student need and like the actual resource. And so I find that a lot of our student leaders is just connecting those pieces together. And, and a lot of that's very much student led with student leadership. And I find that we've been very blessed to have really great student leaders with really great drive and interest um, and all that. I, I could go on forever on that area, but. I do appreciate that. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to attack you, Cassie, just to talk a little bit more because you you just took the words right out of, right out of my head around um, how we can support the integration of our international students and our local students, our domestic students within um, community engagement. And if you can just share a little bit more about those ideas, suggestions, and best practices on how to support those those students. Yeah. I. I think it's really great to be intentional. And I think as an advisor, as a leader on a campus to, to make intentional choices and not just hope things happen, um, but intentionally choose things. So making sure that when we have structures that, you know, are, do we have bias in our recruitment process? Are we really mindful of these things um, it, on our student boards? If we're looking at student wellness, like do we have an area for international students? And is there a space where they can share their voice? And so I think a lot of this is like checks and balances, intentionality. Um, and, and I think it can be, it's really easy to sometimes Think that you're being intentional when you're really not being intentional and so pausing and thinking through we also find that um sometimes i like to think i'm young but i'm not that young anymore <laughs> so i think i know what's going on but i actually don't and i love how um some of you all said it earlier like having your little army of students that can help you out but um we realized our gap in sort of connecting and making sure we sort of had a thumb on the pulse of what students were wanting and needing. And so we created a student advisory council to help advise our office and coach our office in these areas. And so within those areas, and we have one dedicated just for international like affairs and issues, um, whether that's social justice issues, if it's international students. And so um, that student leads that and she works with a group of other students who so she taps into these other leadership circles. And so she's like our liaison and she helps inform and communicate. Um, so then as we're going through our decision-making process, it's it's a lot easier to make decisions when we've been given that information ahead of time proactively rather than reactively. Thank you for sharing. And I would like to just open it up to our other panelists if you all have any ideas or suggestions of how you have utilized community engagement as a tool to integrate both your international and um, local students. Yes, Abedina, FIU as well, the IFIT program, although it is promoted to the international students, it is also open for other domestic students. So when we have the domestic students coming to the group, um, usually the practice has been that we go around the room in our first meeting and we start asking where you're from and then it becomes the opposite. The domestic students are considered a minority in that group. However, they bring so much to the program that we're just happy to have our domestic students integrate as well. Um, it feels like they can also share what volunteerism means to the United States. Uh, they share their experiences. They also share things that the international students do not understand very well about our education system. Uh, so it brings uh, another set of eyes into the program. Besides this, also with the collaborations that we have with the Center for Leadership and Service and the Global Learning Medallion Program, there is integration among students as well especially when we collaborate on serving together in a service project, we come all together, the FIU community, and then there is relationships that happen 
between our international students and the domestic students. Um, those are considered like the, the, the major um, areas where we collaborate. A couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, we also had collaborated with the Office of Study Abroad and their Pantras Around the World program. Uh, study abroad is usually domestic students that travel abroad, so we integrated leadership uh, workshops where our student leaders would come together with the study abroad Panthers around the world program and then created a sense of community as well. Uh, so they are opportunities. We keep a standing on them, but we're right now we're kind of strong on the service component, uh, just looking forward into other ways to integrate them. Yeah, and for our institution, something I want to bring up again, small community college. Uh, something I see would have been very beneficial is to help resident students who, you know, might be Latino, African Americans, Asian, Pacific Islanders, uh, find a place as well, uh, find a community as well. Uh, again, we do have some organization in our institution to support that groups, uh, but we tend to collaborate very close because we found, you know, our international students find good, you know, they found a, a home within those clubs and, you know, but they need more. So we do a lot of things together. So um, all our students of color, you know, have a, a safe space to explore, get to know more, volunteer together and, and find a place. Because um, that is also like for me, I came to the United States as a US resident, I was born here, but I was like an international student by soul, not by paper, but by soul, right? And it was very hard for me to find a place to connect. And uh, we have been able to do a lot on that, to connect our resident and students from different community into our program and get that, you know, it's a big difference being an African American and being an African. And we do, you know, conversations about, you know, what does it mean and how people feeling and safe a space for them to share, you know, their culture. So that has been a wonderful thing for, for us. Amazing work you all are doing on your campuses. And so earlier in our conversation, we talked about um, campus collaboration opportunities and campus partnerships and how um, supporting international students is a, a, a collective, is a, a, a group effort. I want to ask you all, how do you all partner and collaborate with your civic engagement community, service, community service offices coming from the international education, um, international student office, and how do you all implement that community engagement programming? Janari, would you like to share first? Yeah, so the collaboration is, uh, is similar to the integration of international students. It's a simple reaching out to the office and explaining to them the program that uh, we are working on, uh, or the idea of integrating the international students with our civic engagement office. Um, so when the program uh, was launched, there was a lot of collaboration going on because it was something new uh, to our university. Um, the stronger partners were from the Global First Year Office and the Global Learning Initiatives Office, but then it took a couple of meetings with the Center for Leadership and Service to learn about their initiatives and also to kind of uh, cross-reference into what we were creating in our program, and there were opportunities in there as well. So um, I think it, it, in, in higher education, it kind of works like that with any initiative that you have. It just uh, takes one knock at the door or one phone call uh, in order to start that collaboration uh, with other departments because there are so many great initiatives out there that it just takes a matter of uh, uh, bringing forces together and, and also by collaborating we learn about what else is in our uh, university because sometimes our role is like so focused into a bicycle and then uh, just dealing with a day to day operation that we just forget that there are other offices out there that are doing amazing things. Uh, so, by bringing guest speakers from our social justice office, from the Institute of Environment, we're able to kind of expand our knowledge into what the university offers uh, and also bring that into the international student and the scholars as well.
as uh, Janari speaking, I was thinking about a program on our campus and sort of how it got started and where is it now versus where was it started. And so um, we had a program where students just had a really good idea to like support community partners with technology and like IT needs. And so then more people got involved and more people were thinking about it and it was like sort of convoluted. And then we got some student leaders around it. And now we have this phenomenal program called Serve IT. So now instead of having all these sort of smaller things is anytime as a partner, and I hear anything with technology from a community partner, it doesn't matter what's going on. I'm like, Serve IT, like they're your people. That's where you go. Um, and now it's like a full-fledged program. They serve hundreds of nonprofits. And now it's turned like they can get course credit. And I see this happening with a lot of collaborations. It starts with an idea um, where someone's like, here's a really good idea, whether that's um, consulting with businesses during COVID who weren't online and how do we get them online and you know that's an idea and then it took off running with a bunch of people who knew how to say yes to the right things and get things going and so I think our university is really has been really successful at having some really great ideas and then when we collaboratively work together we all sort of help it get off the ground and then they become an expert like once it's sort of rolling they just go and and I really appreciate that is that we have some lanes so that it doesn't feel like it's chaos everywhere all the time or 40 different different people doing the same thing. Um, and I and I really like that idea. We we have these units, and I mentioned earlier the Center for Rural Engagement and IU Core, my office, and we're really meant to be a triaging office to, to help those collaborations happen. So if someone from the community is looking for substance use disorder, like people who are experts in that or students who want to do that, like I know where to go to find those people and connect those people. And so I feel like I, almost like a concierge service, like I'm sort of showing people where to go and what to do and sort of upselling some things. And, and at a large university, my role, and at first I was like, oh my gosh, I have to know all these things, so all these units, both in the community. And it goes both ways. Um, so we also get students who have research interests or desires. And so becoming an expert on what's available in the community. And so collaboration can happen when you have someone who understands both sides really well and can and has that historical context and so that that's been really really powerful tool for our campus for collaboration for us being a community college we do we don't have a civic engagement office i wish um, so what i do is you know reaching to clubs reaching to student governments to OSA. so i just pretty much have to do more reach out um, uh, but you know, the more, the better. And, um, I probably many of the people here that are in community college, they also don't have it, but if you have it and you were very successful on getting your institution by in, please email me. <laughs> I would love to hear from you. Uh, but for now it's just reaching everyone and see who wants to partner up or I, I normally offer the money. I'm like, I will put the money. Could you do the rest? And I get buy in on that. It's sad, but. Yeah, I would love to come. Oh, sorry, Janelle. I, can I comment on, T, uh, on Tia's statement? So Tia, we saw a huge shift in students. I don't know if you all, Janari, if you did, or Tia, if you did. Like before I, I felt like I had to sell every student on like, you really need to do community engagement. It's so important. And now students are like, I'm ready for social justice work. I'm like, I'm just like, okay, everybody get in line. Like, hold on, like, I can't take you all at once. And so that has been, and our administration is very aware that now students are evaluating colleges and fit based off of like, what work are they doing around this? And like, are they taking action or not taking action? And so part of like our office, we didn't exist before, now we exist, is part of our campus's reputation um, campaign and different pieces. And so if you can show them like students are really caring about this and it is part of retention and it is part of recruitment. And now they put our pictures in our recruitment materials of students volunteering and doing our tape art projects and like um, doing our drives and all this, stuff. like, and it's became a more focal point of our our um, website experience was before you couldn't find it. So that that to me, Tia has been a huge shift was I didn't sell it, our students did. Um, and that's been really powerful. What I did and what I'm doing is um, our international student and taking over student government. Uh, last vice president was an, uh, one of my peer mentors and one of my peer mentors just got, just got elected for president. So that's what I do. I put all the international students in the student government and that's how I create awareness. And Americans get surprised, so, you know, all of the sudden I had 
all these Americans, oh my gosh, international students pay so much. Why do you make them to pay so much? And you had the whole student government trying to load tuition for them, right? So it's very, it's very fun. Yes, amazing work on your campuses. And so I know you all have mentioned in our conversation some standout programming and that you and activities that you've done with students to encourage community engagement. But can you all just share maybe one or two of those memorable or outstanding programs that really brought international students to participate in the community engagement? I think for us, there are two, two main, three, actually three. Uh, we we'll start with the garden, with the learning garden. That was the ball. There was a bunch of people, especially because the student could get the food home. So that was a bomb. The second day is a bomb when, you know, you have a students who don't want to engage animal shelters. It works like magic. Everyone loves puppy. Everyone loves cats. Animal shelter works like magic. And the other one, again, it has been a student government. Um, that's where I have seen the most, the most engagement with, you know, the U.S. culture. And very, I, I see how amazing they learn how to balance their own culture with the American culture and how they go and advocate for student needs, not just international student needs, but you know, for all student needs. So a student government, definitely puppies and food brings people together. I'll talk, um, one of my favorite international student events of the year that's service oriented is actually run by our student orgs, um, our international student orgs, and it's called World's Fair. We celebrate at a different time than what most people do it, but it's for the community about cultural education. And so we bring in the community. Student orgs have to register to get to be a part of it. They can win money as part of it. But what it is, is they get a booth space and we have over 100 plus booths. They're judged. They have judges from campus leadership and community walk through um, to see what are the educational components. And I, I'm talking like students build. Like I went into like a student built library looking at um, Latino culture and artists and um, writers or another one like I walked up to a student an Indian student organization and they had a bazaar set up and you had to negotiate and they were selling products but you had a barter back and forth on like what it and they were dressed and so hundreds of booths with this where the community and, and it's just one of my favorite things because our care I could just tell how much our students had planned there was a tea room there was I mean you name it and you're like where am I <laughs> like walking in here and and I love this event um, because the students care so much about both their culture, but also the community and that exchange because people from the community who identify with the community, it's a place for them to connect um, with one another. And the students like genuinely, they really care. And, 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 and it's educational. It's just like everything amazing in one place. And I, I'm to this day and thousands, we have probably about, I think three to 4,000 students who are domestic students who come in support of it as well. A lot of our faculty too will send their students from their courses to come to learn firsthand. So if they're studying in a course about something, they'll send them there. Um, but that's one of my favorites. My others is I love dreaming up stuff we do um, every year we have a, a re, it's called a, it's arts and humanities remix series so we usually focus on a single country so it was Mexico remix India remix and so we have a series of campus wide events but um, those are my favorite because it's for the community our students get to volunteer at it. Um, and we do so many strange it's, I call it passive service programming so will do but it has to be art oriented so to do a community service project that has art um so we did uh placemats we we hired an artist to cut lino mats so we could do print making so we made placemats that then got laminated that then we gave to meals on wheels that then were distributed during um like pre-holiday so it's been really fun to work with our campus especially around different topical themes to think how can we meet a community need which meals on wheels and people being homebound and not connected to art or this and how can we do service so that's that's one of my other favorites is thinking outside the box we did we recycled paper to make new paper that was another fun one we did at one of the arts festivals so i love that's one of my favorite things is working with students to think outside the box to come up with really meaningful service um, opportunities and projects so yeah 
I love it. My fave. Um, and like Kathy as well, um, within our program, there are many, many of them that they're amazing. Uh, but one in particular was actually an initiative from one of the ICA members. Uh, she was a Fulbright scholar probably about two years ago. She brought this initiative to the program because we were at a Halloween event uh, doing activities with kids and she is uh, she is from Thailand. So she came across one of the kids and they were like, are you from China? So she's like, okay, we're gonna, we're, we have an opportunity here. We can bring the culture and language to kids in after school program. She proposed that to the ISA program. And since then it has been one of the uh, most successful programs that we have. We partner with an elementary school we go into the after school program, bring our international students from the ISA program. They create cultural activities. They also create language activities. And they, some of them also dress with their traditional gowns. So we bring the culture into our community and also this awareness that the world is bigger um, outside of the school uh, to our little kids. So that's one of my favorite programs within ISA. Um, and in addition to that, it is also serving our homeless community, going to a homeless shelter. I feel that it creates so much awareness uh, because homeless, homelessness may look different in different parts of the world. Uh, so for our international students, they first go through a workshop on what homelessness means in the United States, a statistics on how it looks like and what it is. And then we go into the shelters and they get to see families as well. Um, that they somehow they entered uh, in this amazing shelter that provides and support uh, meals and also uh, some uh, tips uh, so they can go back into the community and find jobs as well. So creating that awareness into our students is also um, a, a strong part of the program. Um, and then it seems to be also another great program is it's on the sad part of it because we get to uh, connect with people that are in need. Um, but also it creates so much awareness that it is what is needed. You all are doing such, such great work, all amazing, amazing programs and um, opportunities for international student engagement. And I love hearing about um, those just great, like just, you know, the bomb program. So great to hear about all the work you're doing on your college campuses. So as we um, approach um, the conclusion of our webinar today, I do want to um, offer just one more question. Um, I know we're about to run out of time, but um, when thinking about working with and supporting your international students, if you can just name maybe one incentive that you would, you would want to share or highlight within international students of, of, of ways and whys of engaging in uh, community learning and community um, support within, within this, their, their campuses. If we can just name one incentive, that would be great. I can start. We're working right now as a campus to do credentialing for service hours, um, both validation credentialing, and then that credentialing will be managed by the university. So it has validation behind it, but also so it can be used on LinkedIn or other um, applications. We find that grad schools often are looking for service hours. Um, also graduate, sorry, graduate schools and a lot of our employers. And so demonstrating that you've given back and done this type of work. So many more of our large employers um, globally now have service as part of like their organization. They give time off now for, I mean, all these things. And so students are caring more and more that they can get recognized. And right now it's verbal and it's word of mouth or it's on their resume, but it's not validated. And so we're creating a recognition structure right now, um, denoting certain hours and like our levels to, to determine a certain type of community engaged scholar. And so we're really excited that, you know, while maybe some of our international students can't work as many hours um, in a paid position, but they could do this um, volunteer type opportunity, which is very just as meaningful, if not more uh, for many of them. I like a little bit on that, and it's amazing, Kathy, that like there's so many great initiatives that work the same way. <laughs> in, uh, in my institution as well, we're working on a micro credential, which is like a batch as well. So the students that participate in the program, they do get kind of like a skill set and knowledge that they can put into their resume and showcase um, everything that they gather from their participation in this program. 
Uh, for now, it is a certificate that the students get, uh, but it's moving into that direction. Um, and also another uh, another thing is that working with international students and the idea of community engagement is just doesn't work on the local or national level. It's bringing these ideas on the global level. So the global engagement is also amazing um, as how it expands from their participation and also hearing it from the students. I wanna go back home and I wanna support women. I wanna like create women empowerment programs. I wanna facilitate uh, activities for kids. Uh, so it is amazing to hear that, that just with the, their experience in here, they're thinking of bringing these ideas back home. Um, so for us, we don't have anything like that, but something I have been focused a lot is uh, myself as a student and I have seen other students, you know, you volunteer, you do all those things, but then you don't know how to talk about it in your resume, in your scholarship application, in your cover letter. So something we have been focusing is um, working with the career center, helping those students on how to write all these experience down, how to highlight these experiences. It's great that you have a thousand hours of volunteer, but what you learn from it. We also provide the students, you know, with like information about the organizations and we have all that accessible. So when they're ready to do their cover letter and everything, they can dig into that information without having to go all around the place. So that's what we have been focusing on, making sure, you know, that these experiences are not just meaningful for themselves, but also they can apply it. They can, you know, my main focus is as a community college is when you transfer, if you want to be a peer mentor, if you want to be whatever position you want in the school, if you do, you know, all the trainings, you do everything, you can get it. And so far it has been working. Our peer mentors transfer and, you know, they're on top, they're full right the scholarship. So um, that is a very important piece that the students know how to express about their experience. Well, wow. Tia, Janeri, Cassie, it's been amazing. What a great, great enriching conversation around supporting international students in community engagement. And now I wanna turn it over to Anna. Thanks very much, Janelle. And thank you to you, Cassie, Janari, and Tia for the really, really interesting conversation today. It's been really um, fascinating to listen here in the background and read all the questions and, um, you know, get your perspectives here on inter and on engaging international students in the local community. Um, thanks to the attendees for their great questions as well. Um, I think we're all learning a lot here. Um, as always, thank you very much to my colleagues here at the Education USA team for organizing and producing today's event. Um, our dialogues webinar series will resume in the fall. Um, we'll be taking a bit of a break because we've got a pretty busy summer and I'll share with you what we're gonna be um, hosting um, over the next few months. Please stay tuned for updates, which we'll announce through our website, newsletter, and social media platforms. So until the fall, I encourage you to continue engaging with us at some key events we have planned over the next few months. Um, right now, registration is open for the Education USA Forum, which is our annual flagship event taking place here in Washington, DC, August 2 through 4. Um, this forum brings together US Department of State personnel, all of our regional education advising coordinators, and about 50 US um, Education USA advisors from all over the world. Um, this is a really great opportunity for you all to connect with our with Education USA to gain practical skills and strategies how to use Education Re uh, USA resources and services to engage international students and ensure their success on your campuses. Uh, the Education USA Forum will be in person this year. Uh, last two years have been virtual because of the pandemic, but we are happy to say we'll be hosting that in person this year. And there is also an option to view limited content virtually. So check that out on our website and please register. Um, next, after the forum in September, we will be hosting the Europe and Eurasia Regional Forum in person in Belgrade, Serbia from September 19 through 21. And finally, we have the Western Hemisphere Regional Forum that'll be held in person in San Jose, Costa Rica from November 9 to 11. 
And finally, uh, please look for us at the upcoming NAFSA annual conference from May 31 to June 3 in Denver, Colorado. We'll have representation from Education USA, including myself, Department of State leadership, Education USA staff, REACTS, and advisors. Be sure to check out our booth in the Expo Hall. We have a lovely brand new booth to welcome everyone to. And attend our sessions during the week on Thursday afternoon and Friday morning of the NAFSA conference. Our team will be there to welcome you. Um, finally, don't forget, please, to fill out the survey about today's webinar. We had some folks in the audience who had uh, posted some suggestions for future webinars. We'd love to see that. Please um, take a look at the link that's been dropped in the chat. Um, you'll also get an email with this link if you need some time to fill it out later. We really do value your feedback, and we do incorporate suggestions made into future webinars to tailor them to you and to the higher education or higher education industry's needs. And with that, thanks very much on behalf of the whole Education USA team here at the U.S. Department of State, and um, we wish you a good rest of the week, and we will see you soon. Thank you.